Michael Jordan was able to do was take it to that Babe Ruth place. And all of a sudden, overnight, it was just like everybody wanted him. Michael always tells me, it's the first and the last great idea I ever had. <laughs> they helped to sell $3 million worth of shoes, and they sold $126 million in the first year. And we bought into that because what was the tagline they were selling? Is it the shoe? The demand reached a point where crimes were basically being committed. I am in no way, shape, or form blaming Nike for my son's death, but they can say something. I'm not a massive sports fan as I go, and I didn't yeah. really know a lot of the stuff um, that the film touches on as it went through, but it was still like consistently engaging, so it's a quality film. So oh, well done you. on that. Oh, cheers, thank you. That means a lot. <laughs> so um, this is your first feature length documentary outside of making for television. So what exactly drew you to this project? Um, I guess I've worked in television a long time and when I started thinking about this project I'd always wanted to make something feature length, something that might be uh, classed as cinematic, something that could play in cinemas, you know, that was always the ambition to sort of make long, longer form stuff and I guess I gravitated to this subject matter because I had an I have an interest in in trainers and sneakers. I would never refer to myself as a sneaker head, but I was definitely I definitely have a, a an affinity with trainers and have ever since I was, you know, a ten year old in primary school. So, yeah, it just felt like a, a sweet spot to kind of combine this this idea of you know Air Jordan sneaker culture with you know politics and society and sports and just like make a rich sort of multi-dimensional, uh, multi-faceted, multi-layered film that touched on all of those things. Um, it, I, I was interested in telling a story that on one hand you feel is about one thing, i.e., you know, the phenomenon of Air Jordan sneakers. But, you know, if you dig a little deeper, uh, you can sort of like connect the dots and make connections to so many other different things and I didn't ever want it to be a fluff piece or a fanboy movie so just wanted to you know that was the ambition I guess yeah so how was the approach to making this film different to how you were making your documentaries for television oh that's a good question I guess when you make a uh, documentary for television you you, you have lots of resources. You have kind of like, you know, a production company, you have like people that are there to basically serve this, serve you like, you know, as you sort of embark on making this, you know, broadcast TV documentary. Um, this was different. This was like an independent endeavor between like my two friends uh, who are also the producers and the editor, uh, Will Thorne and Michael Marden and, yeah, it was a passion project. It was a passion project that sort of like turned into like a labour of love and it was kind of approached and made over the course of seven years. So it was completely different. I think that we, you know, when you make a TV documentary, you've got six months, if that, to sort of like make it. Um, we had seven years <laughs> to make this and, and no money. You know, it was all our, it was, it was our own money that we sort of like used to sort of like make this film. So you know, I I wouldn't want to kind of like take seven years again to make a film, but the fact that we had the luxury of time in making this film is the reason why it kind of works. I think if someone had given us like a bag of money in, in 2013 when we started, you know, shooting this film and said, you know, deliver it by 2014 or 15, it just wouldn't be the film that it is today. So we always had, you know, the, the luxury of time and we always had I guess creative control to sort of like tell the story in the way that we wanted to tell it we weren't under any uh, pressure you know to sort of compromise so that that felt really good yeah seven years is a long time to make anything so how yeah. <laughs> how how did the final film differ from your original vision of the film okay so originally the film uh, I, I wanted to tell, tell a story about Air Jordan collectors, like specific uh, collectors. I'd seen lots of films on sneaker culture. I'd seen lots of films about collectors that collect lots of brands, but I'd never seen anything uh, that profiled Air Jordan collectors specifically. So that's where, that was the entry point, And I started sort of like making that film. And then I realized perhaps after a year that you could 
they just go onto YouTube and like find those guys um, being profiled. So I didn't think that it would sustain, you know, a feature length film. And then I started thinking about, well, what about an origin story that looks at Air Jordans? Because that's pretty interesting and that hasn't been, you know, explored in any depth before. And, and that's when I sort of became a little bit obsessed with, you know, tracking down the men and women who were responsible for creating you know the Air Jordan phenomenon from you know the college basketball scouts from uh, the, sh the early shoe designers from Michael Jordan's agent from uh, NBA executives who kind of like oversaw you know the the, the globalization the commercialization of, of the NBA in the 80s and 90s it you know I, I began to think about all of those things and began you know I was hell bent on sort of like telling that story and, and getting those people. So that's how it evolved. It started with the collectors and then, you know, it kind of morphed into sort of like an origin story about Air Jordans ex exploring, you know, this phenomenon and this marketing deal. So, yeah. Sorry, yeah. let me just turn my phone off. No, that's all right. But yeah, I mean, touching on the people you got to speak to, you got to interview David Falk, um, Michael Jordan's former agent. So that's, mm. that's a pretty big deal. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it was insane. Like, and, and that interview was only done last year. So David Falk, like, so yeah, the, the back end of last year, no, uh, yeah, the back end of last year was our last sort of like shooting period. We sort of like went back to the States for like maybe two weeks. And that's when we got David Falk, we got David Stern, and we got uh, Jamil Hill, I think, in, in that period. And they're, they're people that I'd always, you know, wanted to, to, to involve in the film. I've got emails of, I've got email correspondence with like Jamil Hill, um, when she used to work at ESPN from 2014 and like, you know, and like asking her for an interview, but we couldn't make it happen because I was in Houston and she was in Orlando for Thanksgiving and we just couldn't make the, the dates work. So, and the same with David Falk, I'd always, you know, dreamed and hoped that he would, you know, be in the film and, and, we we just got lucky with that and the same with same same with david stern you know unfortunately he passed in january uh which is really shocking but you know he was an incredible uh man you know i think if a lot of credit sort of like goes to nike and goes to michael jordan for sort of you know the phenomenon of this brand then credit should go to david stern as well because he provided a platform in 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 the nba to sort of you know, revolutionized the way that we saw brands and that we saw superstar athletes. That was, you know, that was all under his watch when he was commissioner. So it was incredible to sort of like meet him and spend time with him. And he was extremely generous with his time. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah. Well, one thing that I really loved in the film as a whole was this, was this like bombastic and bold aesthetic especially yeah. in the animated segments. So yeah. how did you settle on that visual style? So I guess we started thinking about that really early on. I think that you could trace that back to the first taster that we ever did. We made like a six minute taster, I think in 2013. And we always knew that we wanted to have uh, animation and sort of like uh, a visual aesthetic that was like really interesting you know uh, we didn't necessarily just want to talk in head and archive and then also you know archive is really expensive so we just wanted to find uh creative ways in which we could get around not you know burning loads of cash on on archive and and do that in a, in a creative and engaging way so we knew like you know when we started the process that you know, animation and sort of like graphic design would play quite heavily in 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 the film. And yeah, like the, we had like one graphic um, animator, illustrator, a guy called Wolf, a guy called Will Newell, and he's incredible. You know, he kind of he was so incredible with his time and just so inventive and everything that he ever sent us was just like, oh my god, that's incredible! How did you do that? Can we have more of that? And that was the process. And he was one of the early people that you know, was working on the film in 20, 2013 and 2014. So yeah, like a core group of like four people made this film. So he was one of them. Yeah. So in, in that way, having a, having a smaller team work on the film, was that a, was that a, did that better the film or did it detriment it in terms of reflecting on your past work in television? I think the, 
like working with a small team, I think perhaps simplifies the process because it's almost like it's it's less a it's less opinions and it's easy for for it's it's easier for three people to be all on the same page than it is for like you know fifteen people or twelve people, which is sometimes you know traditional with when you're making a TV documentary. You've got all the people at the production company and then you might have people at the channel and commissioners and stuff. And there's quite a few people that will have an opinion on on the film. And so I think when you've got three people, it's it's a lot easier to just navigate it. And it's a lot easier to sort of, you know, whittle down feedback and thoughts and, and just get on the same page. So I would say it was, it, you know, it, it's a little bit easier. Um, but like I said, this is, uh, you know, this is an independent film and it was made with no money. So, yeah, we couldn't afford anybody. <laughs> we couldn't afford anybody else. So it was just us, you know, it was just me and Will Michael and, and the other Will, Graphics Will. And yeah, everybody was just kind of like doing this for the love of it and do it, doing it because they believed in the project and they thought it was a good idea, you know? Yeah. Um, not to give anything away about the film, but it does take quite a dark turn did you mm. intend for that when you first started playing the film yeah I, I did I kind of you know when I was a teenager um I was aware that there was uh you know just an air of senseless violence around you know these sneakers and I didn't want to shy about it my entry point into this film was fandom and was almost like you know we wanted to celebrate this incredible brand and the marketing savvy of these, you know, really incredibly smart people. But we also wanted to be authentic and not revise history and, and talk about, you know, the unfortunate legacy of this sneaker as well, which is the, the violence. We wanted it to sort of like be a warts and all story, you know, not, not to leave things out for the sake of it. Or we felt it was our responsibility to sort of like just present the facts and I think the third act of the film it's all facts you know you can just go you can google that stuff or youtube it and you'll find cases uh, unfortunately so yeah it was always something that we wanted to uh talk about and not necessarily shy away from just present it as it is and that's what I think we did I mean it's, it certainly grounds the rest of the film because everything in the first mm two acts of the film feels so huge and meteoric that all mm. of a sudden it all comes crashing down and you can see the real consequences of it yeah yeah no definitely it, it kind of feels like almost like a cause and effect you know i think if it's uh it's kind of like a it's about america's love affair with consumerism or you know our our love affair with consumerism and you know how companies and corporations you know just employ tactics to to market stuff to us and when that gets out of control these things unfortunately happen so yeah it was important to to document that and and talk about it you know yeah i mean in keeping with that obviously one of the overarching messages of the film is an anti-capitalist one um, mm. do you struggle to balance that with celebrating the marketing powerhouse of the air jordans no not really i i think that it's it's part and parcel. It's, it's just kind of like the world that we live in, you know, I, it's capitalism, capitalism is a fabric of all societies. And I think, you know, the objective for any brand is to make money and, you know, we consume stuff because we like it or it's because it's been marketed uh, to us in a certain way. So I don't think there was any uh, agenda or sort of like, you know, we didn't go into it in the sense that we're going to tell this story about capitalism. We're just going to tell this story about this sneaker and, you know, connect, connect it with all of these other things that are, you know, intrinsic to, to, its, for, to, to its legacy and its phenomenon. So that it was never, you know, it was never at the forefront of our minds to sort of go in and, and sort of like talk about the fabric of capitalism. It was more, it was more, let's tell the history of this sneaker. Let's talk about how they did this. And let's talk about the financial implications because it's really interesting and people don't know. And then let's just leave it with the viewer to sort of like make up their own minds about, you know, how 
this this brand in particular has sort of like achieved all of this and other brands also you know i think it's a part of all of our lives like so yeah yeah over the course of researching the film and understanding Mm. everything that came with the rise of air jordans did it change your relationship with sneaker culture um not really because i've never been a sneaker i've never been a, a sneaker connoisseur or sneaker head per se you know i've i've always had uh, an interest in trainers and sort of always been, you know, I've always been interested in the marketing of them and like, you know, how they use athletes to sort of, how they use athletes as pitchmen, but I've never been into the, like the culture as a whole. And I think that was perhaps why I was able to kind of like tell the story in the way that we have. Um, yeah, because I, I wasn't I wasn't attached to it. I wasn't I wasn't really interested in making, you know, a fanboy movie about Air Jordan sneakers. Um, and perhaps if I was, you know, intrinsically in love, and you know, a sneakerhead, like a really passionate, enthusiastic, enthusiastic sort of like queue outside and and for for trainers uh, type of guy, then perhaps I wouldn't have been able to have that distance to sort of tell the story in the way that we have. Um, but yeah, not, it, it didn't change. No, it didn't change my opinion because I'd, I'd always knew that that existed. It was more just kind of like, how can we document this in a, a coherent way that feels accessible to people and doesn't feel sort of like too exclusive and too fanboy boy and too like anorak, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, that's brilliant. Well, that's, that's all the questions I've, I've got for you. Oh, awesome. Thank you. No, no, thank you. Thank you for being a part of this. This has been brilliant. No worries. No worries. Thank you so much for your time and the questions too.